O Lord my God, in you do I take refuge. Save me from all my pursuers and deliver me. Lest like a lion they tear my soul apart, rendering it in pieces with none to deliver. O Lord my God, if I have done this, if there is wrong in my hands, if I have repaid my friend with evil or plundered my enemy without cause, let the enemy pursue my soul and overtake it. Let him trample my life to the ground and lay my glory in the dust. Arise, O Lord, in your anger. Lift yourself up against the fury of my enemies. Awake from me, you have appointed a judgment. Let the assembly of the peoples be gathered about you. Over it return on high. The Lord judges the people. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to the integrity that is in me. Oh, let the, dev- let the evil of the wicked come to an end, and may you establish the righteousness, you who test the minds and hearts, O oh, righteous God. My shield is with God, who saves the upright in heart. God is a righteous judge, and a God who feels indignation every day. If a man does not repent, God will wet his sword. He has bent and readied his bow. He has prepared for him his deadly weapons, making his arrows fiery shafts. Behold, the wicked man conceives evil and is pregnant with mischief and gives birth to lies. He makes a pit, digging it out, and falls into the hole that he has made. His mischief returns upon his head, and on his own skull his violence descends." I will give to the Lord the thanks due to his righteousness, and I will sing praises to the name of the Lord, the Most High. So it seems that we are living in an ever-increasingly angry and uneasy world. I'm not sure if this is actually true, but it would appear so by the way to which we talk to each other, especially in our debates around cultural, social, and political issues. Um, Those conversations are increasingly spurred upon more and more out of anger uh, and uh, are the result of, uh, uh, and the result is because they come more and more from a place not of a uh, debate upon the merits of the other side's positions, but on the immorality of the other side, on the brokenness, the evilness of the other side. And with that has come more protests and attempts to silence the other side from sharing their beliefs. Um, interestingly, we are doing all of this while we are turning away from the idea of truth in an absolute sense and from institutions as divinely given and have divine meaning. And we claim those things, those institutions are mere instruments for our own pleasure and hopefully our happiness and for our own good as defined by ourselves. So we are in this strange place where we talk with an appeal towards some kind of absolute morality, a demand for justice, while on an individual level, uh, we uh, deny it. And when we seek meaning in our lives, we deny that there's anything beyond us that can define what is meaningful and good and true for us. We dislike the idea of a righteous law-giving judge, Especially so when paired with the idea that wrath could come from such a judge. While also demanding and calling for more justice and seeking to punish in silence or a desire for wrath to be inflicted upon the other side, the evil side, the immoral side. It's truly a confusing and bewildering time for us as we deal with these realities and we have these conversations increasingly on uh, more angrier and uh, uneasy uh, positions and sides. And today we're confronted with the, we come to a psalmist who's calling out for a righteous judge to pour out wrath. And so what do we do with these ideas? How do we deal with them? How do we handle them? I think in this appeal, I think we're going to see how a righteous judge is good for us how it brings peace and meaning to our lives where darkness and emptiness reign apart from it and how it can be bring peace instead of a violent nature to which we all once had or still live in. 
So to do so, I want to take a quick look, a breakdown of uh, Psalm 7 with you. And then we're going to talk a little bit how, about how we need a righteous judge. What it means uh, to be, uh, what we mean by the idea of a righteous God. And how we can stand before a righteous God. How we can't stand before a righteous God. And how Christ changes that for us. So we have a need for a righteous God. We need to stand before one. But we can't stand before one. But Christ changes that for us. So let's take a look at these. Uh, I think you can break up uh, Psalm 7 into five uh, categories. We start with the first couple of verses. that We have a prayer for refuge. And 3 through 5, we have an oath of innocence from uh, David. Uh, in uh, 16 through 13, we have God's righteous judgment that David is calling out for. Uh, and uh, verses 14 and 16, we have a judgment of the guilty. And in that last verse, we have a praise of God's righteousness. I'll read those one more time if you want to write them down, and then we'll go into them. Uh, verses 1 through 2, we have a prayer for refuge. 3 through 5, an oath of innocence. 6 through 13, God's righteous judgment. 14 to 16, a judgment of the guilty. 17, a praise of God's righteousness. So verses 1 through 2, a prayer of refuge. O Lord my God, in you do I take refuge. Save me from all my pursuers and deliver me. Lest like a lion they tear my soul apart, rendering it in pieces with none to deliver. There is a, a, a almost an unseen refuge that David is appealing to in this uh, scripture. Um, and he's repeat, he, uh, he speaks to God as his God. Oh Lord, my God. It's, uh, it's stated as if uh, the refuge is already fact. Since it was located not in himself, not in a, an appeal to which God finds merciful or God finds appealing, but the fact that his refuge is God himself. And that, is, that means that he has placed himself in God's hands and so within God's will and there is peace there no matter what happens. God is his forever refuge in David's eyes and so he has this appeal of a, almost an unseen refuge, a constant refuge to which he knows exists. His oath of innocence, you see these these three ifs. Oh Lord my God, if I have done this, if there is wrong in my hands, if I have repaid my friend with evil or plundered my enemy with cause, let the enemy pursue my soul and overtake it. Let him trample my life to the ground and lay my glory in the dust. These three ifs. Look, if I've done what is being said about me, so what David is saying here is there's, there's someone is slandering my name. Someone is saying I've done something that I haven't done. But if I did those things, then I deserve wrath. And so we have uh, David calling out to God for justice. And this appeal to his own integrity, his own goodness now, it should be noted that this is not a universal appeal to his own goodness. David is not saying, there is nothing bad in me. I have never done anything bad. He's saying, what these people are saying about me in this particular instance is not true. We also see this idea of uh, how one should treat one's friends and enemies in here. If I've repaid my friend with evil or plundered my enemy without cause, he says, these are not unfamiliar ideas in the Old Testament, nor to David. In Exodus uh, 23, 4 through 5, it, we read, uh, if you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, you shall bring it back to him. If you see the donkey of one who hates you lying down under its burden, you shall refrain from leaving him with it. You shall rescue it with him. In Proverbs twenty five twenty one, if your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. These are things David knew, and that we see, in fact, that this is something that is a pattern in David's life. In First Samuel twenty four, uh, starting in verse eight, uh, David is uh, heard that Saul is out to kill him, 
And uh, he has uh, come into Saul's presence and says afterwards, David also arose and went out of the cave and called after Saul, my lord, the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David bowed with his face to the earth and paid homage. And David said to Saul, why do you listen to the words of men who say, behold, David seeks your harm? Behold, this day your eyes have seen how the Lord gave you today into my hands in the cave. And some told me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not put my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, see the corner of your robe in my hand. For by the fact that I cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you, you may know and see that there is no wrong or treason in my hand. I have not sinned against you, though you you hunt my life to take it. So we have this idea of uh, how do we treat people? How do we treat uh, those who are our enemies, those who are hurting us, seeking to harm us? Then we see uh, God's righteous judgment in verses 6 to 13. We see uh, David's appeal to arise, come up, stand before us, above us, look down upon us, Exert your authority, your power over us. Bring out your anger, your fury on your enemies. Awake, appoint your judgment upon us. And in verse 12, we see that if a man does not repent, God will wet his sword. He has bent and readied his bow. He has prepared for him his deadly weapons, making his arrows fiery shafts. So we have a God who is righteous in judgment. And that judgment will end for those who do not repent in his wrath being poured out in death. But we see why it doesn't happen immediately. There is a God who desires to give an opportunity for repentance. Sometimes when we go through life and we think, why isn't God doing something? One of the answers is he's giving someone an opportunity for repentance. He's longing for an opportunity for someone to, longing, or he's hoping someone will repent in the midst of what is happening. We see that for David, his shield again is with God. Verse 10, my shield is with God who saves the upright in heart. That idea of in heart tells us what is our sin, where our sin issue lies. It doesn't lie in the behaviors we can see in each other. It lies in the place our heart dwells, where our heart is situated. Uh, we see throughout Scripture that uh, the obedience of the members of the Trinity is in glorifying the other two giving themselves to give value, to help the, the, us to see the worth, the glory, the import of the others, to recognizing it in themselves and celebrating it, worshiping it. For us, like the people who didn't recognize God's glory in David and sought to slander him, we slander Christ, God, constantly. We have a God who has created us and said, in me you can have all your heart's desires. In me you can have everything that you most deeply need. But we go through life and we make decisions. We speak on what is important to us. We tell our friends on what exciting has happened to us. And in every one of those instances, we almost always glorify something other than God and thereby slander the one true glorious thing in this world. We are constantly in how we act, behave, what we pursue, what we spend our time doing, and what we speak of, telling the world what is glorious. And most of the time when we're honest and we look at ourselves, it is not God who the world is seeing as what we glorify. And thereby, we slander. Our heart's condition is not set 
in God's glory. It is set in this world and hoping to find glory, to find worth, value, import in it. Our actions follow our heart. Where and what do we worship? That is what we glorify, and most of the time, we don't glorify God, and we don't worship Him. We slander Him. Uh, Luke 6, 43-45, Jesus gives this story of a tree. He says, For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of the evil treasures produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. Out of the abundance of our heart, where our heart lies, we will speak and show the world what we glorify, what we worship, what we give import and value to. We see uh, what uh, David says the two results will be of that heart condition. He says uh, that we will be fertile in sin, So we will ultimately be like a pregnant lady who gives birth. As we look at uh, verses 14 and 16, Behold, the wicked man conceives evil and is pregnant with mischief and gives birth to lies. Verse 15, He makes a pit, digging it out, and falls into the hole that he has made. 16, His mischief returns upon his head, And on his own skull, his violence descends. So we'll be fertile in sin. As our heart condition worsens, we'll continue to grow in sin. James uh, 1, 14 and 15 says, But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, gives, gives, uh, or fully grown, brings forth death. He also says not only will, will uh, sin get, be fertile in bringing forth evil, it'll be futile. It's like us making a pit, digging it out, and we fall into the hole that we have made. Nowhere to go from there. Utter darkness, separated from all that we had hoped to gain by digging of the pit. So it will be, we'll be fertile in bringing forth evil and futile in bringing forth what we hope to gain from it. 1 John 2.11 says, But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. We're stuck in a pit, consumed in darkness, no longer knowing where to go. What I hoped would give me, what I longed for has failed me, and I don't know where to go from here. I dug a hole, I fell in, and I am empty and blind. And then in verse 17, we see a praise of God's righteousness. I will give to the Lord the thanks due to his righteousness, and I will sing the praise to the name of the Lord Most High. Derek Kidner, in his commentary, says, on this change of themes, uh, this idea of Most High is a little seldom found uh, title outside of the Psalms, but it's first encountered in the story of Melchizedek um, and Abraham. It comes from a Canaanite region, gave a, the Canaanite region gave a similar title to Baal. Um, but Abraham, as David does here, claims it explicitly and only for the Lord. It is especially appropriate as the last word in the psalm, announcing in faith as an ever-present fact the exaltation with which 
uh, we see in verse 6, David longs to see proclaimed in power. This God, the Most High, sitting above his creation, with justice, doling it out as a just and righteous God would. And so the psalm moves from an intense personal plea of a man who's betrayed and hounded uh, to the conviction that God is judge of the earth and will dole out judgment and that wickedness is self-defeating. And so it ends with confidence and praise that there is a God who is most high and will, in fact, dole out his righteous judgment on this world and on his enemies. So a quick run through of Psalm 7. Let's talk about this idea of uh, our need for a judge, our need to stand before a judge at some point. Um, Arthur Miller, uh, uh, some of you may know him. He's a famous playwright. Uh, Death of a Salesman and the Cru- Crucible are probably his two most well-known plays. He wrote one called After the Fall. That's probably his uh, least critically acclaimed uh, play, but uh, one of his perhaps most intellectual and academically interesting plays. Um, he had an interesting but a, a tough life at times. At one point he was married to uh, Marilyn Monroe. The marriage didn't go well. Uh, he got divorced um, and uh, he was hurting. And he uh, writes this play soon after that. In the play there's this the main character, Quentin, who, went, who has, a very, has a very traumatic life experiences um, and some unsuccessful relationships and divorces, one most uh, recently. And he's met someone new and he decides to re-examine his life as he attempts to decide if he will marry uh, this new love that he has met. At one point in the play, he says this. For many years, I looked at life like a case at law, a series of proofs. When you're young, you prove how brave you are or smart. Then what a good lover. Then a good father. Finally, how wise or powerful or what the hell ever. But underlying it all, I see now there was a presumption that I was moving on an upward path towards some evaluation where God knows what, I would be justified or even condemned, a verdict anyways. I think now that my disaster really began when I looked up one day and the bench was empty, no judge in sight, and all that remained was the endless argument with oneself, the pointless litigation of existence before an empty bench, which of course, in another way of saying, despair. So what he's saying is that he went through life and he gave meaning to a bunch of different things for a couple of reasons. First, because they proved how good he was. I was brave, courageous. I was smart, a good lover, a good father, wise, powerful. It speaks to the righteousness problem that he has in his heart and we all have in our heart. We all know because we have denied God, we've slandered God and his glory, that we are wrong. There is something in us that is broken and needs fixed. And we try to prove our goodness. We try to prove our value. We try to prove ourselves as he did. But of course, there has to be someone that says, yeah, you are in fact good. There needs to be a judge. Without a judge, there is no way to deal with our righteousness problem. There's no one to say, good job, my good and faithful servant. There's no one to say, You've gone from broken to fixed, from unrighteous to righteous, immoral to moral. But also, there are institutions to which we claim uh, are good for us. Family, marriage, children, 
work, service, community. These institutions to which we always connect ourselves to because we believe they're good in some way. But without a judge giving meaning to those institutions, what do they become to us? Mere instruments for our pleasure. And so if they don't bring us pleasure, we can move right on along. It was great that I was a good father at one point, but there's no real meaning to being a good father. It was great that I was a good lover at one point, but there's no real meaning to being a good lover. I can move on. It was great that I was a good coworker, f- neighbor, friend, family member, church member at one, at one point, but there's no real meaning to any of that. There's no divine definition. There's no divine act that made those things, that gave those things meaning and purpose. And so I am not obligated to those things in any way. There's no joy in me remaining in them even though I don't find pleasure in them right now. We can just move right on along. But with a righteous God, we can know that there is meaning to our life. If there is one who judged, then there is one who gave a purpose. There is one who has a plan. There is a meaning to your existence. There is a meaning to your relationships. There is a meaning to your talents. There is a meaning to your abilities. There is a meaning to everything that you have. There is purpose behind why you have and why you exist. There is no empty bench before you. There is no darkness in the bottom of a pit. There is light. When my marriage shows the world the glory of God through the husband being like Christ to his church and the bride being like the church to Christ, there is meaning to it beyond just what do I get out of it. When God uses the imagery to show us his glory, of of his own glory through stories of dads and, and children and moms and children. When he tells us that we should be fruitful and multiply. When he tells us that in our families, his glory can be brought to those around us. There is meaning beyond just I get pleasure, or I don't. When our talents are given to us by a God who says, with those talents, you can be my glory to this world. How we use those talents is not just pursuit of pleasure any longer. There is purpose. There is design. There is real meaning. There is no point to which we can say, I am dark. There might be times of uncertainty, but we know that there is someone sitting at the bench who has given a purpose and a design for all that we've been given. We need a judge. Because without a judge, there was never a purpose. And without a purpose, there is no meaning. A righteous God. What does it mean when we talk about a righteous God? Fred Zaspel uh, wrote an essay on the idea of God's righteousness. I'm going to steal from it uh, frequently in this part. Um, It's brilliant. Find it online if you can. There's a summary out of it on Gospel Coalition, I believe, as well. Um, First, he defines it, and he says, The righteousness of God is the divine attribute that describes God as acting always in a way that is consistent with his own character. The righteousness of God is the divine attribute that describes God acting always in a way that is consistent with his own character. Why? Because he is righteous. He is righteousness. 
Uh, we see throughout uh, the Psalms uh, that uh, he is declared as righteous and just, and that those are the foundations of God's throne, um, that he himself is right, just, and true. Righteousness is essential to his very being and characterizes all that he does. God is morally and ethically right, and he acts only in keeping with what is right and just. We must not understand, though, the idea is not that God is bound to some abstract rule external to himself. That would imply that there is some standard above him. There is a God above him, so he is not God. There is a different God. No, he is, of course, the standard, because he is righteousness. That is where righteousness is found, in himself, and he conforms himself to himself in righteousness. Then Frank, uh, um, or Fred, I'm sorry, tells us about four different kinds of righteousness, righteousness that we should know. He says the first is rectoral righteousness, uh, which he defines as God's rectoral righteousness is that aspect of his nature which demands or requires righteousness of all his creatures. So God creates us and he gives us a law. It's pretty simple. This is probably the easiest one for us to understand. It's one we most commonly associate with God. God is a lawgiver. God defines what is good and evil and expects us to conform to that understanding of good and evil. He then talks about retributive righteousness. He defines God's retributive righteousness is that aspect of his nature which inflicts punishment for all unrighteousness in his creatures. So, um, God is a lawgiver. Those who break the law will be punished. I am righteous. I demand righteousness. I am holy. I demand holiness. Not only that, I am, I am righteousness and I conform to myself. I have never gone against my own self. I have always been righteous. I've always been holy. And so those who have not should be punished. Uh, this aspect of God's righteousness we, is a first expressed in the garden uh, of Eden, uh, where we read, In the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Speaking of the tree to which Adam was told not to eat. It's not the mere, it's not the only mention, it's not merely threatened. Uh, we see it dole, we see God's wrath doled out uh, in the garden, in the flood, Babel, Sodom and Gomorrah, Egypt, the Canaanites, the captivity of Ananias and Sapphira, on and on and on. Um, Paul talks about it uh, in the uh, New Testament. He says, uh, uh, "We have neither produced righteousness nor could we be, er, or could we? Sorry, um, sorry." He says uh, in Romans one eighteen. He speaks to. I'm lost in my notes here. I'll find it. I'll come back to it. Paul speaks to it. Um, But we have to deal with this idea of retributive righteousness. We have a judge that we have to stand before. We have this predicament of a righteous judge that I mentioned earlier. So we have a judge we need, but we can't stand before. Because his wrath will necessarily be, have to be poured out on us. He is righteous and demands righteousness. God demands righteousness and will surely punish all unrighteousness. He can't do anything else or less than that. Fred says, uh, we have neither produced righteousness nor could we be, or could we by doing so pay the penalty of past sins. By ourselves we stand hopelessly condemned before a just God. It would be unjust of God to allow us to stand before him as unjust people, to allow us not to be punished for our transgressions, for our sins, for our slander of his glory. And so then we come to uh, the realization of God's redemptive righteousness, as he says, redemptive righteousness. That he defines as the aspect of his righteousness by which he provides righteousness for his offending 
creatures. That aspect of his righteousness by which he provides righteousness for his offending creatures. We see throughout the Psalms this idea of our deliverance is found in God's righteousness. Psalm 71, verse 2, deliver me into your righteousness. Isaiah 11, 4, with righteousness he shall judge the poor. Psalms 51, 14, David's forgiveness resulted in his singing aloud of God's righteousness. In Isaiah again, 45, 21, there is no other God beside me, a righteous God and a Savior. Isaiah 51, 6, my salvation will be forever and my righteousness will not be abolished. Isaiah 54, 17, every tongue that rises against you in judgment shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. The heir and their, or sorry, the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. Isaiah 61, 10, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. Paul in Romans 1 speaks of the revelation of the righteousness of God. When he's speaking about Christ coming. Christ is God's redemptive righteousness. It's born out of his righteousness. God never stops being righteous. God never stops being just. God never stops being holy. But he's also graceful. He's also merciful. He's also forgiving. And so he pours out his redemptive righteousness on Christ instead of us. Christ took the wrath and the death we deserved. And not only that, um, he exchanged his righteousness and gave us, he gave us his. He switches our righteousness with himself. He dies in our place and he gives us his in our place. He doesn't become a sinner, but he becomes like sin for our benefit. Um, Last year I talked about this idea of uh, Christ's active and passive obedience. Uh, This is what he says in his uh, uh, essay. He says, "This this is what has often been referred to as Christ's active, passive obedience. Born under the law, he actively performed for us all that was our responsibility to perform. And in our place, he suffered the full penalty due us for our sin. He is the end of the law for righteousness. We are found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is God, from God in faith. Christ is the substitute sinner providing a substitute righteousness. It is, this, it is in this way that Christ's righteousness is revealed to the gosp- in the gospel. So righteous is God that he would not spare even his own son as he took the sinner's place. The punishment was administered fully and righteousness is freely provided. God then is both just and the justifier of him who believes in Jesus. The redemptive righteousness of God. The redemptive righteousness of God is, is not that he ignores our slander, our sin. It's that he punishes a substitute in our place. And that substitute who lived a perfect life, always glorifying God, never slandering, never glorifying something above him, gave us his righteousness. Then he talks about remunerative righteousness. Uh, He says uh, this has to do with the distribution of rewards according to justice. We're told throughout scripture that we'll be rewarded for our good works. Um, and says, he says the point here is not that God is obligated to us simply, but he has, he has obligated himself to us by promise. And so we read that scripture of the tree and how fruit bears what that tree is. The tree doesn't bear fruit different what, than what the tree is. And so we've been given Christ's righteousness. We begin to bear the fruit of Christ's righteousness. And God's promise to those who bear the fruit of Christ's righteousness is good things. 
for here in this world that is namely peace separated from the circumstances of this life. For us in heaven, that is everything we hoped our circumstances would be here, perhaps absent of those circumstances, depending upon your view of heaven. But what we hope to get from them in the truest, most absolute form, never lacking, never missing, never disappointing, never not getting what we expected. As Christ will become the only circumstance to which we truly depend upon. God becomes our soul glorifying figure. The only thing we ascribe worth, total worth to, never let down in the absence of his goodness. Because his, a- his goodness is never absent for us. Here, our trust in it will never lack there. Our eyes will always be set upon him. Our faith will be entirely connected to him. And we will receive great rewards. I don't know exactly what the biblical pictures mean of what those rewards will be. I doubt we're going to have streets of gold, but it will be like walking down a street of gold. Maybe it will be streets of gold. I don't know for sure. Uh, But it will be glorious because we will be connected to the one and true glorious thing continually forever in fullness. And so we have assurance. Uh, I don't know if many of you have ever watched uh, The Good Place. Uh, it's an interesting TV show that has ended now. Um, I'm, I think NBC ran it. I watched it on Hulu. I don't remember exactly. Um, I find it interesting because it's, it's uh, fairly funny, slightly academic, and interesting. Um, the premise basically is um, for a group of people have been sent to hell, and uh, they're trying a new way of punishing people. And so what they have done is they have set up a place that they tell them is the good place, and they make them solely figure out that they've been sent there wrongly. They should have been sent to the bad place, and they're trying to, to make their life miserable that way. Long story short, end of the story, um, these four people uh, of them, or f- these few people of them, uh, Two of them have fallen in love, and they are now looking at the reality of they're likely going to go to the good place for eternity. And before them, in one of the final scenes, is a, a booklet that contains all of their good and bad deeds on earth. And uh, one of them says to the other, you cannot ever read my booklet, because she's afraid that he will fall out of love with her if she reads her booklet. And then she changes her stance later and says, no, you need to read it right now, everything, because I don't want to go, I don't want at some point later in eternity for you to find out all these evil things I've done and then not love me any longer. Like if we're doing this eternity thing for together, then I need to know we're doing it together now and not that you're going to fall out of love with me later. And this is the beauty of our relationship with God. He knew every time we've ever slandered him. He knew every time we've cast glory on something other than him. He knew every time we turned our back on him. He, in the garden, uh, as he was praying for the cup to pass, felt the fullness of God's wrath on him and said, I'm going to go forward to the cross even though I know everything you've done, even even though I know the excruciating reality that is going to be my life separated from the Father on the cross. And so we have the assurance that it's been paid. There's nothing God is going to find out about us later that's going to make him go, okay, never mind. He knew the fullness of our evilness. He knew the fullness of the cost to which it would take to bring us into redemption. And he paid it in full. And so not only do we have the assurance, we have the reality of who we are. I'm a, I have a heart full of slander towards God. I have a heart hardened towards God, saved from that because of God, not because of me. 
brought out of the brokenness because of God, not because of me. Bearing fruit of righteousness, not because of me, but because of the righteousness given to me by my substitutionary atoner, Christ. My future is set, is assured, because not of anything I've done, but because of what Christ has done for me. And so, when I am confronted with the, the dreadfulness, the evilness of those separated from God, or those recovering, those growing in their redemption, and in their uh, um, righteousness in Christ, within the church as well, my heart changes. I no longer see just the evilness. I see their brokenness. I no longer respond only in anger. I respond with empathy and compassion because they are broken as I was once broken. They are blind and empty in a pit that they dug themselves as I was once blind and broken in a pit that I once dug myself, lifted out from by God, not myself. And so we can be like David. But David, of course, at one point fails as far as upholding life. David became, David at one point sins in a big way. We all know the story. He commits adultery. um, And he tries to cover it up. David's in a pit, blind, and doesn't know what to do. And he continues to try to cover up. He ultimately commits murder. And for us, We can look back upon David and say, I know where David got it wrong. God didn't blindly save me. God, with his eyes fully open of who I was, saved me. Fully open of what I'm going to do going forward, saved me, died for me. I don't need to cover my sin. My righteousness does not come from me. It comes from God. At one point, David, after he's been exiled, is walking along a road and one of Saul's men finds him and they're kicking rocks down upon David and and mocking him and the men that had stayed with David says, we can kill these guys. And David's like, no, some of what they're saying is true. It changes our heart. When we recognize our righteousness doesn't come from ourselves, it comes from God. We can be confronted by things of slander, confronted by people who are speaking to us not out of love, not out of empathy or compassion, not out of our own goodness, and see what they're saying about us that might be true. Because my love for God's righteousness is greater than my own need to prove my own righteousness. And so every opportunity, I can see my brokenness, I can see the slander in my heart is an opportunity worth seizing. It's worth appreciating and grabbing hold of, and growing because of. When I'm confronted with the most evil, the most vile, if my heart is always stone, if no point when I'm confronted with those I consider inflicting the most pain in this world, do I go, that person is hurting. God, please meet them in their brokenness. Heal them. It's because you haven't understood a righteous judge is your only way out of the pit you dug yourself in. You are no different than them except for how your slander was portrayed outwardly. If you've not become compassionate, empathetic of the broken, you haven't been confronted with the reality of a righteous judge. If you go through life and you recognize people's hurts only when it's connected to your passions, only when it's connected to your happiness, You haven't been confronted with the reality of a righteous judge. You're still clinging to the things of this world as your place of hope. 
But when you, where you know where your assurance lies, outside of this world, in the hands of a righteous God, you don't look to this world focused on what you need from it. You look at, to this world focused on what and how you can serve it and what way you can serve it, how you can serve it. You are drawn to those people who are broken, who are sinning, because you know their brokenness and you know their need and you desire to be there to help them. If you've been confronted in major ways with the reality of someone's brokenness and at no point have you been willing to be God's ladder for them out of the pit they've dug themselves into, you haven't confronted the reality of a righteous judge in fullness yet. Because when you realize who that God is, what he's done for you. It changes how you view the broken, the hurting, the sinner. And so we take care of the donkeys and the horses of our enemies. We feed and and give them water where needed. Now, we are still called to care uh, for the oppressed, and sometimes that's going to take on very different roles. And so this is not an appeal to, uh, to uh, pacifism uh, in any absolute sense in that regard. I'm not going to go into that conversation, but I'm not telling you you need to be a pacifist. I am telling you, though, that if you, are call- if you feel God is calling you to action to help the oppressed, it doesn't come from a place of anger, a place of, of wrath necessarily for you. That's God's job. It could come from a place of compassion and love and God calling you to serve someone else. But if you're not hoping for the salvation of the person that you are confronted with their evil, that proves the brokenness of your own heart. A righteous judge gives us meaning, gives us hope, gives us assurance, and changes our broken heart our selfish heart, and to selfless people who can serve the needy, the broken, the hurting. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that that you are righteous, that you are holy. We thank you that we can trust beyond a shadow of a doubt that, that we will be futile in our evil, We know that because we were futile people seeking hope in places where it could not be found, always being left empty and longing. We thank you that you reached down into our hole we dug and pulled us out by your death, substituting our righteousness as your own and your righteousness as our own, making a way for us to be redeemed through your righteousness, to be assured that we will be connected to your glory for eternity, that that connection will be full, complete in heaven, that your promise is true, never wavering, can always be counted on being fulfilled. We thank you that uh, because of you, we can be different. We have meaning. We have fullness. Our relationships, our families, our communities, our neighborhoods, our cities, countries, our world, our talents, our abilities, our gifts. They're all, they all have purpose. They all have design. They all have meaning. Forgive us for not recognizing that enough, for not submitting those things to you enough. Remind us of the gospel in our hearts and our minds so we can grow in that regard. Assure us of our salvation. Fill us with your glory so we can serve. We can see the broken and the hurting, not just from a worldly perspective, but from a heart perspective. 
the most wealthy, the most status-filled, can be the most broken among us. Break our hearts for them. Father, we call, call us to act. Here, around the globe, tell us where to go, where to serve, how to help. The world is longing for a righteous judge to find meaning, to find peace, to find assurance. Help us to know how we can serve you. In your name we pray, amen.